after some trials and other tribulations, I finally, finally finished the shed. Last we left off, Anne and I had finished applying some house wrap to the outside of this thing, and I was very excited to finally get some siding on here to rid ourselves of the sound of Tyvek flapping in the breeze. I'm using some T111 siding here because it's easy to just cut and apply, and I made sure to prime all my cut edges to prevent any moisture intrusion. Getting the first sheet on by myself was a bit of an adventure, but once I got it spaced and plumbed up properly, things ended up going pretty fast. After getting the first sheet in place on each corner, subsequent sheets were really easy, just making sure to get the proper overlap between sheets and nailing things in place through to the girts. Once I got the hang of it, this bottom row went super quickly, then it was just a matter of cutting some shorter pieces to fill in the empty areas on the front and back. Then before moving on to the angled side pieces, I figured I'd better get some more blocking in here to attach the soffit to once I got to that step. Alright, now back to those angled pieces. After some little bits around the door, I could finally cut into my creation and see the inside for the first time in a while. Ah, Tyvek Crinkle. I did have a little bit too much overlap on one corner, so I got to put my new favorite thing to the test, the oscillating multi-tool. After that was done, I figured it was a good time to start getting some coats of primer on the trim. I probably should have just gotten prime trim, but this stuff was just so much cheaper. With the trim drying, I figured it was a good time to get started on some doors. This door frame design is pretty simple, just some flat 2x4s attached with pocket holes, but I must say this did not yield the flattest doors, so if I had to do this again, I would probably turn the 2x4s on end so the doors were a bit deeper, and I think that would have given me doors with less twist in them at the end. The trickiest part of making this door was probably getting the siding panel attached in the appropriate place so that all of the gaps would end up where I wanted them to be. To get this right, I laid down a piece of plywood on my door threshold that was equal to the gap that I wanted between the frame and the floor in the end. Then I just slid my adjustable square down to find the gap and then use that measurement to position my door frame to the back side of the panel. Then I tacked the frame to the outside panel with some screws, flipped the whole thing over, then used some siding nails to make the final attachment. If you're thinking to yourself, that doesn't look very secure, you'd be right. These things definitely blew off during a windstorm, but surprisingly only once. All right, time for some soffits. To cut out the vents, I first mark the locations, then use the track saw to make the longer straight cuts, and then finished off these smaller cuts with the oscillating tool. I really love this thing. It's like an X-Acto knife for wood. I had some small wire mesh left over from making crawl space vent covers, which ended up being perfect for this. It cut really easily with some tin snips and then just stapled in place. This side will face up when it's installed so you won't see these staples. I still can't quite figure out why I decided to try this with a step ladder when I have a perfectly good, perfectly solid extension ladder about 20 feet behind me in this shot 
with a stabilizer at the top, but today stupidity prevailed. Luckily when I did start to fall I could feel it coming and was able to jump down relatively unscathed, but that sound you hear is my left knuckle smacking the top of the ladder on the way down. Ouch. Oh look, an extension ladder. Now I know you can get pre-made vented soffit material, but honestly I kind of like the utilitarian look of the OSB here, and it's pretty cheap so I decided to go with that. In any case, it went up pretty quick once I got the right equipment with some inch and a quarter screws. Now I know, again with the step ladder here, but the extension ladder is too tall to clear the fascia on this side, so I didn't really have any other choice. Yeah, I have nothing insightful to add about that one. This side was a little bit tight, but that is one nice thing about using screws. You can kind of just suck everything into place. After the soffits were done, it was time to close up shop for the day. I think you're technically supposed to add flashing at any horizontal panel gaps like this, but I decided to try my luck with just some caulking. And one note about caulk, I started off using some cheaper white trim caulk, I honestly don't remember the brand, but I actually had it freeze and crack on me overnight, weirdly. So I ended up switching over to Lexel. It is way more expensive and it's amazing. It sticks to everything and it has stayed super nice and pliable even through some 7 degree Fahrenheit weather that we had here. So highly recommend that stuff. For paint, I started by brushing on a sort of buffer zone on top and bottom to give myself a nice clear area to roll onto without worrying about hitting the soffit up above or the flashing down below. This did work pretty well, but I think I'll actually do it in the opposite order when I put a second coat on. It was pretty easy to control the roller, so I didn't need to do as big an area as I thought. The roller didn't quite get into all the grooves in the siding here, so I had to come back by hand and fill in with a brush. Lots of audiobook listening going on here. After the paint, it was time to move on to pre-constructing my corner trims. I just rough cut them to length, then used some wood glue and brad nails to secure everything together. I was actually really looking forward to getting these on because after doing so, the shed would finally be pretty sealed up against the rain, eliminating those big corner gaps in the siding panels. This is actually something I found myself wondering about quite a bit during this build. I know construction doesn't just stop during the winter, but I just have no reference for how much rain building materials can take before it starts to be a problem. I'm reusing this window from the existing garage, and I started off trying to be delicate about it, but quickly moved to a more destructive and much faster method. To cut out the window opening, I drilled a quick pilot hole, then installed a flush trim bit in my router. This is super convenient because the bearing just rides against the rough opening framing on the inside and gives you a perfectly clean cutout to drop your window into. Final prep for the rough opening involved installing some zip system stretch tape all the way around the sill starting at the bottom. The idea here is to prevent any water that might get in from sitting against the windowsill and eventually causing rot. This is definitely overkill since I'm not going to seal up the wall cavity inside, but it was good practice anyway. Installing the window was pretty smooth sailing, just leveling it up and then using the remaining nail holes in the window flange to secure it all in place. I actually was intending to put a bead of caulk around the sides and top before installing it here, but I forgot. The last step in the installation process was to apply some window flashing tape around the perimeter, but of course not the bottom so it can drain. Next up, cut and install the corner trim. It was pretty easy to just cut an angle at the top since I knew my roof was a 212 pitch, 
Then I just marked the bottom, cut that square, painted the ends, and installed it. Starting off with some brad nails here, but I quickly moved to screws. Ah, here we go. This is actually the stuff that froze and cracked on me. I guess now we know it was dap caulk. Sorry, dap. To install the trim on the doors, I made sure to use screws on the sides that would have the hinges installed, and I made sure that these screws would go all the way through the trim, through the siding, and to the frame in the back so they would make a strong connection. Using some brad nails worked perfectly fine for the rest. To install the hinges, I used a self-centering drill bit and some stainless steel screws that were long enough to go through and connect to the framing on the inside. That crinkling sound is actually a result of those screws being a little bit too long and going through and puncturing the house wrap on the other side. This felt like a huge milestone, having two doors that I didn't have to carry and that didn't blow off in the wind randomly. As usual, Anne was my assistant on the inside, helping me shim these doors into place. I quickly addressed the screw length problem here, and then just took a sliver of siding off of the right side door to fix some binding that was happening when the door was closed. keep these guys closed and keep our stuff safe, I installed a lockable latch, which led me to discover another great use for the multi-tool. And the very last bit of trim to take care of was the stuff around this window. As soon as I started moving things from the garage into the shed, I quickly realized that I was going to need some basic shelves. Thankfully, this was the last bit of lumber that I had to buy for this project, and it went pretty quickly. The design here is super simple. Each shelf just consists of two long stretchers in the front and back, which are connected in the middle by some supporting pieces. And to keep things ultra simple, I'm just using deck screws and butt joints for everything here. No need to complicate it. These shelves will be supported on one corner by the center post of the shed on the inside, so it really only needs three vertical supports. I got the first two attached to the bottom shelf and then moved the whole thing inside. After leveling everything out, I got the third vertical support installed, secured the bottom shelf, and then moved on to the top shelf to square everything up before going to the middle shelves. Doing this by myself, I found it really helpful to install these temporary blocks just to hold the shelves in place, even if they weren't exact, I could tack the shelf in place with some screws, then take the blocks off, do the final leveling, and secure everything in its final place. I'm pretty happy with how this framing turned out, and I think the whole thing probably only took a couple of hours. For the tops of the shelves, I was actually able to use some offcuts from the siding that ended up being the perfect depth. All I had to do was turn them over and screw them in place. There were a few other little organizational things that I did that I won't go into here, so let's just cut to the chase and take a look at the final product, shall we? guys, that is it for this series. Um, this is the first ever real structure that I've built, um, and it was a super fun, satisfying, and educational experience for me. Um, is it perfect? Definitely not, uh, but it is definitely also serving its purpose, which is to 
provide a safe, dry place for me to store this stuff while we tear down the other garage and prepare to build something really awesome over there. Uh, so if you made it all the way through this series, thank you so much for watching. I won't draw out the end of this video, so um, take it easy out there and I will catch you in the next one. <laughs>